name is Tasha Nupa Livermont Barondo, and I'm Oglala Lakota from Pine Ridge. I currently live in Brookings and I've been a journalist, but mostly a homemaker. And I've been a member of the Oak Lake Writer Society for some time. And I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Ed Valandra, who is actually uh, a cousin of mine. And he is Sichangu Jitua, born and raised on the Rosebud Sioux Reservation. He received his BA in chemistry from Mankato State University, his MA in political science from the University of Colorado Boulder, and his PhD in American Studies with a Native Studies concentration from SUNY Buffalo. Dr. Valandra has served his nation, the Sichangu Tituwa Oyate, in various capacities. He served a four-year term in the Rosebud Sioux Tribal Council and was a representative on the Intertribal Bison Cooperative. And he has also served on his nation's seven-member constitutional task force. So we are here because he is also the author of numerous articles. And in 2006, the University of Illinois Press published his book on the termination era in the U.S. and South Dakota, titled Not Without Our Consent, Lakota Resistance to Termination from 1950 to 1959, as a, with a foreword by the late Vine Deloria Jr., who he also studied under. And so we're going to be talking about Public Law 83280 and a whole bunch of acronyms and numbers, but as uh, C. Jesse has told me before, we're really good with the acronyms in Indian country. Welcome, Ed. Well, thank you, uh, Tashi. It's good to be here, and that uh, I want to welcome the uh, the listeners who will uh, listen to the podcast, and um, I'm very happy to be here. So, thank you for that nice introduction. Welcome. And so we chose your book as part of Native Reads because it bridges a really important historical, um, not just time frame, but also gets into the nitty gritty name giving details of the termination policies in the 50s, which in a lot of ways kind of was setting the stage for the you know, American Indian movement and things that we think of later with the American Indian Renaissance. Do you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about how you, as a historian, really got into um, the termination era? I th I think we, you know, being born and raised in the in a uh, historic Great Sioux Nation, a lot of this a lot of this information is out there. We've heard about termination. Um, and often it's in the form of state jurisdiction. Those are the those are the battle lines that seem to clarify that. Most recently, with the uh, uh, checkpoints at the borders, you know, we see that even manifested today. So there's been a real um, broad interest, I think, in 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 uh, Ocheti Shakawi governance around this issue of of uh, jurisdiction and. Of course, that relates to sovereignty, that relates to the treaty status that we have with the Americans. And so I think being born and raised in, in the historic Great Sioux Nation, uh, we, 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 come, we come to this um, world born politically. And as I mentioned in, 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 in the book, uh, Not Without Our Consent, um, being on a tribal council, I you know that's where you really uh, see that relief between uh, what we know to be uh, like uh, indigenous sovereignty in our case, Ocheti Shakui sovereignty, and then our relationship with uh, the surrounding community, you know the the Washitu community, or as we like to say, the Milihanska uh, people. And so, um, so, so it was just part of growing up. It was part of that process. And, um, and I grew up in a political family as well. My father served uh, eight terms as the president of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. And so when a lot of this was going on, I was eight, nine, ten years old. And um, I have often mentioned the fact that a lot of what I learned about uh, Lakota politics was underneath the kitchen table. Um, I do recall times when 
uh, community members, uh, other other Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota leaders uh, would come visit, and there would be discussions and things like that. So I I I had that um, those kind of trappings around me, and so. Um, I think it was particularly true when I was on the tribal council and we'd always have these uh, great uh, jurisdictional battles with the state of South Dakota over a number of things. And um, and the question is always why. And I knew about the 64 referendum, I was aware of that. So that's what I started doing my dissertation on. And as it turns out, I as I was going through the the archives, um, I was beginning to uh, see references to another referendum that had taken place. And so that's how I got interested in this particular um, part of the termination era. And of course, that that leads to other things. I mean, you had to, at least I had to get into the, into the research of the Public Law 280, House Resolution 108, and then what was our response as, you know, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people with respect to the state of South Dakota? I mean, there's, there's, there's so many different um, strands that it took a great effort to, to weave them into a narrative of, of what our response was to this uh, state push for, to assume jurisdiction over our homelands. Yeah, let's, if I can um, interject, let's kind of go over how the termination era started, because I, I don't want to assume that um, every listener maybe knows what the termination era is. And I know for me, being around Oak Lake for a decade, it's been an education. I don't know that I really heard about the termination era like or spoken of when I was a kid, but I definitely, as I read the book, realized how impacted all of us. Um, are because I think this is still playing out in border towns today in Indian country. Um, so, you know, when we refer to public law 83280, that was actually federal policy. Do you want to kind of talk about that and how it sort of came to the attention of Washichu peer legislators <laughs> in South Dakota and, uh, and it kind of started playing out more um, in grazing and in law enforcement. So could you kind of set that stage for us? Sure. Uh, you, you know, one of the things about um, we have to understand about the termination era, it was one of many um, enactments um, or actions ever since uh, 1492. Mm -hmm. It's always been it's always been the American policy um, as a result of settler colonialism um, to displace and eliminate native peoples. So that, so that was not, you know, that's just, that has a long history and an ancestral history. Uh, so this was one manifestation of it. So when public law 280 came, uh, that was, that was just a land grab, a piece of legislation there were all kinds of rationales around it, you know, free the Indians, um, uh, you know, the United States and the other other, other allied powers um, had defeated, uh, you know, uh, not the Nazism uh, going on in Europe and, of course, in a in the Pacific. So there was. There was a confluence of a lot of different things going on, and and uh, I think it seems like termination, uh, basically, uh, with this long history, was another opportunity for this for for the for the Washiji to go ahead and devise another policy to um, Americanize uh, Indigenous peoples, and so you know you had these uh, very conservative. Uh, uh, you know, mostly Republicans, but let's let's not fool ourselves when it comes to indigenous issues. Uh, the the differentiate be the differentiation between a Republican and a Democrat, particularly out in South Dakota, collapses. At that point, it just becomes a white party. 
Um, right. Because I was also, I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was really um, captivated by the fact that the World War II, like anti McCarthyism stuff, was like part of this. Well, yeah, and and that's what they that's what they always use. Uh, they always bring out those kind of tropes when it comes to um, indigenous peoples, particularly the assimilative process of the genocidal process. They they will rationalize it in so many different ways that resonates with uh, understandings um, that you know most white Americans. Or just Americans in general have been uh, socialized to. So it's a very complex and very nuanced um, policy, although termination couldn't get any more nuanced than that. <laughs> um, but but it, it, it came out of that, you know, and it came out of the recognition that um, even during World War II, um, you know, the, 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 um, the Germans and the Japanese often made references to particularly the black soldiers. You know, what are you doing fighting these wars over here when even in the United States, there's segregation, there's lynchings, there's, there's a lot of um, contradictions. And I, and I think the Americans eventually realized that that was not a sustainable uh, posture to have after after World War II, so you see a lot of movement to um, go ahead and and, and open up uh, social spaces, political spaces for people of color. Uh, but it was still it was still it was still a fight to do that, you know, with the Brown versus Board of Education and those kind of things. So, you know, um, at one level, termination is an Americanization process. Uh, to in- integrate indigenous peoples uh, into the um, into the U.S. Uh, body politic. Yeah, and I and I didn't mean to say anti-McCarthyism. I meant anti-communism and McCarthyism. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting how I I thought how you know America is supposedly fighting this great war on freedom, and then turns around and actually starts um, you know upping in many ways the ethnocide. Um, by um, the public law 83-280. So um, that was uh, an August 1953 enactment. um, And it sort of set off a whole series of events in South Dakota. I mean, it looked different depending on where in Indian country you were. But overall, um, I think it had a unifying effect. I mean, (laughs) I feel like America often confuses uh, like this hardcore um, authoritarian version of communism with um, tribal collectivism and like small C communism. And so this, this sort of focusing um, on us and it pulled into some issues like with ethnocide, the idea of wardship. Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about wardship and then how that rolled into blood quantum as well? Oh gosh, you know, it, it, and and this this discussion really shows how, um, you know, and, and I think this is this is one of the major issues. I think when Indigenous peoples have this conversation, and then when non natives, particularly uh, Washiji, try to engage in it, there are so many of these terms and concepts out there that is very complicated. And I know when. As we're having this conversation, if there are non-natives listening to this, we're throwing out terms and phrases and understandings that would leave them really um, in a purple haze. <laughs> they would have a hard time staying staying up with this conversation. But the wardship, again, you know, that came out of that came out of one of the uh, the Marshall trilogies. I can't remember which one in particular, but it could be. Um, Georgia versus a, a Cherokee Nation, in which that term was put in in there, and it was just a way to describe the relationship. And John Marshall, uh, you know, who happened to own slave and speculated native land, was one of the Supreme Court justices, um, used that phrase. And and from that point on, that had kind of become 
the center around which indigenous people were deemed incompetent. And in fact, that is still by federal law and regulations, um, it, you know, were basically incompetent until proven otherwise. Uh, and if you want, if you want evidence of that, just look at our land titles. Things are held in trust for us as as a ward. Assets are held in trust by someone else. So, so that concept got played around quite a bit, and wardship was used as a way to you know, always uh, free indigenous people, give them citizenship, whether they wanted it or not, um, establish a blood quantum of one half or more white blood, and then you you attain this competency. So it's been used for a multiple of sins to really divest indigenous peoples of their land and of their political autonomy and their national character. So, so wardship is you know, it's one of those terms and phrases that still has a long life even today and still does affect how, um, you know, settlers look at indigenous people and relate to indigenous people, let's say at a policy level. Definitely. Um, so when it, you know, when Public Law 83280 became on the, the radar for uh, South Dakota legislators, um, we... So South Dakota looked at, so they started Public Law 83-280. Do you want to talk about a little bit about that? Yeah, Public Law 83-280, I, I think, came not soon after House Resolution uh, 104. And, um, you know, that that was just a sense of, of where um, the U.S. was at with respect to indigenous peoples. and. So when when uh, Public Law 280 came, it was it was like like an emancipatory act for Indigenous peoples, where this relationship that that we have with with, with settlers, it's a political relationship defined most most um, obviously by by the by the treaty relationship we have, and so what. What that tended to do was to um, suppress, or if not, just eliminate that treaty relationship. And so I think that that's what termination, you know, it really is genocide in, in, in one sense. It was a land grab in another sense. But it also went to the core of, of not recognizing this relationship that we have by treaty in which we are we have a political uh, characterization. We we are we are we are nationals of our own nations, and and so I think Public Law two eighty, uh, you know that was that was pawned off as as again as an Americanization program. But what it really did was it what it really did was to say. To us as indigenous peoples, and particularly as the Ocheche Shakoni Oyate, to say, you you will no longer be sovereign people. I mean, that's just that's just the boldness of that of that law, and this is how we're going to do it. And so, and 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 really, that was that was the definition of Public Law eighty three two eighty, and that's why. So many indigenous uh, peoples and nations galvanized to fight that law because we knew what was really at stake in that, you know, in that arena. Uh, most Americans looked at it as, well, you know, you're just going to become another another American. And for us, it was like, no, we're going to lose our national identity if we don't fight this law. And so it was. So there was so much, so much at stake. Again, land, political status. And a host of other things that go along with being indigenous peoples. Well, and so we we'll get to the referendum in just a second, I promise. But you devote quite a bit of time um, to the Oglala um, taxation um, and fees. And I had I think I we visited the other day. I was telling you about I ran into somebody local here, East River, who was like, 
you know, Washichu and was like, yeah, we, you know, we were, we're white, we live on the res and we owned our land. And then all of a sudden, like we had to pay fees <laughs> and taxes or something about, then we had to pay for it, you know, pay lease or pay whatever. And it just like is astonishing how like kind of the squatter mentality, um, like how people have absolutely no idea <laughs> what they're really talking about. And so when the Oglala well, Lakota decided to tax uh, non-tribal ranchers, right? It was non-tribal, I think. Right. Um, do you want to, you want to talk a little bit about um, how that played into this? Because, you know, there's organizations, well-known organizations today that are running around and they were, you know, they were leading the charge to for termination because they didn't want to pay these fees and South Dakota stock growers is one of them. So (laughs) we, I mean, this is not ancient history is what I'm saying at all. So do you want to talk a little bit about um, how that um, sort of galvanized Washichu reaction? Sure. Because it's very reactionary, you know, like it's, I mean, it's predictable, but yet it's reactionary on the, on their part. Yeah, and and this 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 goes to the core of what what we call you know white supremacy, uh, white entitlement, or sometimes what I call settler settler uh, entitlement, in which during the, during the time when they were when termination was introduced, part of what we didn't talk about, but 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 is true is that it was a cost saving feature too millions of dollars that the federal government expended as a result of the treaty relationships, you know, health, education, and these other things, um, was supposed to be a savings to get out of the Indian business. Well, you know, our, our Ogallala Tito and relatives said, well, you know, we have this taxing power and we can tax. So they decided to um, tax the people that were leasing uh, our land, and at that time, particularly in the fifties, most of the people that leased our land were white farmers and ranchers, and so that was the idea to tax these um, non-members. And, and and what people got to realize is, you know, they, they called it a tax, but but really it was a fee, it, because it it was an acknowledgement that, you know, this is n- you know, these white farmers and ranchers, uh, it's a privilege to lease our land, you know, although at, you know, rock bottom rates, but nonetheless. Um, so there was the lease and then there was that tax or fee, however you want to call that, was put on top of that to raise money because, you know, the the Ogallala Titoan said, look, we're going to lose all this money. We got all these assets. We'll start raising this money. And that's what began that whole process. That's where it really began to pick up steam to the mid to late 50s. And, and this is where the first referendum came into play. And it was just as simple as that. You know, it was just a, it was just a, a challenge to, um, you know, and, and, and that was, that's a very audacious move by, by, um, you know, uninvited guests to say, we're going to use all your resources and, 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 and make a profit off that and live well, despite the poverty that we see around us. So when the disempowered began to utilize and exercise some, some authority over, over their governance and then start taxing uh, those people who um, were leasing land, Using using Lakota land, um, that's where the real fight started. At that point, it, it could almost, I think, in the book I might have mentioned, you know, this mentality about taxation without representation. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually on that page because what <laughs> right in that area. What I thought was really interesting that you mentioned was, you know, we hear about Governor Mickelson of a later era with the reconciliation councils, and in some ways, Oak Lake was. Um, uh, I guess, originally invigorated by some of those ideas and ideals. Mm -hmm. Um, And Mickelson was actually a federal judge. And he was, it's the same Mickelson, right? (laughs) It's been a while since I... Father. 
Okay, his father. Okay. So, um, but he actually had an earlier precedent and ruled that this wasn't taxation without representation because white ranchers did not have to take the bids for the lands in the first place. Exactly. And it's like political science 101 that a government has the right of taxation. So going back to, you know, this idea, definitely a Western idea, right, of statehood and nation, na- nationhood, but that the power of taxation, I mean, that's a major, major thing. So we're rolling into kind of the Iron Crow rulings and all of that. But to just sort of um, think about this for a second, um, I really was interested in how um, this idea of taxation, you know, by the tribes, um, you know, it's it did. It kind of set off. I mean, that as well as the same highway jurisdiction fight that we're seeing with the blockades. Um, earlier this summer and uh, spring for COVID. Um, but these were, uh, these are fundamental uh, state, uh, and when I say state, I mean nation rights by the tribes themselves. You know, we call it the state of South Dakota, but really these are state as well, um, our tribal nations, um, like I said, in a political science version. Um, and so do you want to maybe Speak more than to. Um, I find it really interesting that this this exercise then of nation nationhood by the tribes has this <laughs> uh, reactionary um, component by the Washichu, and then in some ways, I found your book very hopeful because it seemed to me that as we didn't start the fight. <laughs> so to speak. We were just doing what was already our right to do. And then they, you know, through this fit and it actually in some ways kind of doubled down in the courts that yes, we are nations. So do you want to get, let's talk about the referendum. So yeah, the referendums, the the, the first referendum, I think um, was settled in 1958 and, and, uh, you know the um, the Lakota, the Kota, and the Kota leadership at that time uh, went through that process. You know, it was it it was a bill introduced in the state by, of course, a white white rancher or farmer out in the western part of South Dakota. So uh, we were drawn into that political process, and um, I don't know if I don't know quite from what from what I know and read in those documents. It, it wasn't. I, I don't think the 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 settlers were quite sure what they really wanted. I mean, the way that referendum happened was really was really interesting. That we got a consent clause put in that 1958 law, and then and then when they went at, went at it in 1964, there was no consent. I mean, that was just it. So so what that allowed us to do in 1958 when the when the when our leadership, the Ocheche Shock's only leadership, got that clause put in, I, I call it a self-executing clause because if we didn't hold those referendums, we were acquiescing to state jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. And that was really, and I think that was the the uh, the trade-off there was all right, you want this consent clause, you have to have these elections, these referendums by such and such a date, and if you don't, then that's then you're acquiescing to, to state jurisdiction, um, and and what was and what happened in that case was every every one of the reservations had a referendum that was ran by us and was organized by us, and so we ran that referendum internally among our own uh, reservations, and so it turned out that. We reject we we rejected state jurisdiction, so so that was the end of that, and we all thought that was that was the end of that. I mean, now I mean, did um, did Public Law eighty three two eighty have the consent clause in that um, based on treaty, or did it come straight out of the treaties? Um, I can't 
can't quite recall how that works. I mean, in Indian country, we say the treaty is the supreme law of the land next to the con American Constitution um, when it comes to uh, federal policy and dealing with these uh, American Americans. Um, but like the reason why we had a referendum, which, you know, referendums is something that is being is under attack in the state of South Dakota today. We're, we've been seeing that for a couple of years. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of people in, in power that would like to get rid of the right to take laws to a referendum vote by the voters. And so um, I think it's really interesting, you know, um, how the referendum has been used in Indian country then. But but back to the um, consent, you know, back to the book title, Not Without Our Consent. Did it come from treaty or and was that rolled into Public Law 83 280? I, I, I think I think that I think the um, while one one could argue that that the framework of treaty relationships had a lot to do with consent. Mm -hmm. But I think in this case, what what the leadership did was they put those arguments on on the settlers saying, well, you know. Um, it, it's, it's an American tradition to get consent. And of course, a social compact is, you know, built on uh, the consent of the governed. So right. I think they were using those kind of arguments to get that consent clause put in there. And uh, but that but that becomes very critical later on, much later. But at that point, um, I think there was there was a general understanding of of consent being in the ether, but it got operationalized. Uh, when the Ocheti Shakoi leadership at that time said, look, um, it's only fair that we should have a vote on it. And, and so they flipped that argument. And, and, I, and, it's, and the state went with that. The state legislators went with that. Of course, they put a condition on it, you know, to, to be self-executing. So um, to answer your question, um, Maybe in a, in a more conceptual way, yeah, it had a lot to do with our relationship with treaties and consent. But in this particular case, I, I, from what I read, it was more of an argument like, yeah, um, that's why we vote as Americans. You know, we have this idea of, of having voice. And so that was, so that was a bit of a, a flip on that. And I, and I really think that um, the settlers just really underestimated that um, because at that point, you know, um, it was generally agreed that we didn't really vote in, in, in state elections, county elections, city elections. We voted in our own elections by far, but I, I, I would say that the settlers really underestimated that argument of having a a referenda, referendum on each reservation. Mm -hmm. So, tell, you know, kind of walk us through what happened after that referendum. Well, you know, after that referendum, I, I, I would think the, the leadership of the OJT shock when we said, well, you know, uh, we dodged we the dodged bullet on that one. But, um, you know, Indian fighters, they don't give up so easily, it seems. Um, so, so there was that 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 referendum on each reservation to reject state jurisdiction emboldened uh, the white farmers and ranchers to even push harder because you know the Ogallalas uh, they they were asserting their, their autonomy uh, by taxing and of course there was this movement to to um, assert uh, self-government, if not sovereignty itself. But so there was this movement of the native country that you know we are we are nations. In fact, uh, you know there was a ruling, a Supreme Court ruling that described uh, tribes or native nations having a higher status than the states themselves because states don't make treaties with with the federal government, but we do. So we may have a higher status than states. 
But I, but I think the movement and the activism as a result of termination that was going throughout Native country was energizing a lot of indigenous leadership within the framework of Indian Reorganization Act government to take more control over the internal affairs you know, of our, of our reservation. So, so you see a lot of movement in that regard. And I, and I, and I would argue that, um, particularly out in South Dakota, I think a lot of the white farmers and ranchers realize that this movement of self-determination had several implications for them. And we see the result of that, you know, 40, 50 years later, but you know, they could see the writing on the wall that there was this energy and this movement for more control over the land and of the and of the jurisdictional aspects of governance. So so that was really the 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 state of South Dakota and and all the legislators were all white. Even if they were, even if there was a one or two female, they were all white, and and um, so the so they understood that this was a this was going to be a contest between um, self determination and state oppression, and it got down to that eventually. But there was a series of other laws that were introduced that didn't go get very far. There were different kind of um, Local court cases, like from Winter and other places, border town uh, um, court districts, that were that were actually saying, um, "Well, you know, we we just can't arrest indigenous people in or, on their reservations and haul them to a to a, to a basically a white court in a border town and charge them." You know, the habeas corpus was becoming really big, like an unlawful detention. So a lot of things were moving in that direction, and I, I would I would argue that um, in the '60s, in the beginning of the '60s, when a lot of things started taking off in, in the United States, you know, you had the civil rights movement, and you and and even then, be having the 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 makings of an environmental or ecological movement. So there was a lot of social disruptions going on at the time, and I and I would say that um, it all it all came to a head like in 1963 when the state of South Dakota just said, "Look, the legislatures just said we are going to take jurisdiction, regardless. It, it don't matter. We're just going to take it." Well, that was that was the that was the um, that was the most credible threat that the state of South Dakota gave to um, our people. And it was very, and they did it under the guise of public law 280. And so there was, there were certain options that we could have exercised. We could have gone to court, of course, or we could have cut the best deal we could, which was there. But this leadership that we had was so amazing at that time. They actually said, um, "Look, what, what what we can do is this law has been passed, but there's a there's a there's a referendum clause in a in a South Dakota state constitution that laws that are passed can be put up for a referendum. A very risky, very risky business. Uh, one, we were outvoted. I mean, there were more there were more whites who were registered to vote than there were Lakotas, Dakotas, or Nakotas. I mean, that was so the numbers weren't good. Um, you know, we were just outnumbered. We were out-resourced. I mean, you had these, you had the Republican Party and you had the Democratic Party, but when it comes to indigenous people, it becomes a white party. So they had resources for that. Um, they were in control of the of the apparatus um, because this was going to be a state referendum. Um, they had control of, of the whole process, and that the difference between the 1958 referendum and the 1964 referendum. Recall that in 1958, the referendums were reservation by re reservation. This one 
the indigenous leadership, you know, the Lakota, Dakota, and Lakota leaders petitioned to have that law put on a statewide ballot. And that was extremely risky. Very, very risky. And um, again, for all the reasons, out, out, outnumbered, out-resourced, they were in charge of the, of, the, of the political apparatus. And so that was a very risky, very risky uh, move because we, we, we could have got, we could have got uh, swamped easily by that. But that leadership had a plan. They actually sat down and devised a plan. And they did some oppositional research. They looked at, they, they knew the border towns. They knew how whites thought. And so they devised a really brilliant plan to overturn that 1960, to overturn that 1963 law in the 1964 November referendum. And the argument that won the day was not one of, you know, um, we're, we're, uh, we have a treaty relationship, you know, you can't break, you know, you have, you, you have made promises, you know, and there, and it, the ethical, um, arguments didn't, didn't win the day, but what won the day was, um, the, the oppositional research that the indigenous leaders did at that time was to say, well, the federal government subsidizes or transfers a lot millions of dollars to the reservations and if that goes then the state has to pick that up and that it became a pocketbook issue and that's what won it for us the whites were unwilling to pay taxes in lieu of the federal subsidies that they would lose and that leadership uh the ocheti shakoni leadership really hammered that hard and they did a really effective job. And so when the actual statewide referendum came in 1964, that state law to take jurisdiction over our reservations was defeated by almost, for every, for every one that voted for state jurisdiction, four voted against it. And that was, that, again, that was in 1964. So. So, so that was that was the definitive um, act. Again, if we didn't initiate it, the settlers initiated it, but we 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 ended it. We put a stop to that kind of state jurisdiction. You know, that 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 move to take to take our homelands and put us all under state jurisdiction. Um, so if I may, I, I, I will say one thing about that referendum. It's the only referendum of its kind in North America. There's not been one native nation that has done what we've done. And, we, and, and so it was a very definitive statement by the Great Sioux Nation, or what we say the Ocheti Shakoi. Whites were given an opportunity to vote on whether or not they would accept jurisdiction. And they voted no. That has not happened anywhere in the United States at all. Nowhere. So we stand out as the one Native nation that gave even the settlers an opportunity, and they said no. That was very, that was very significant. And, um, you know, um, in 2014, the 50th year of that law, we, we don't see any celebrations by by the Lakota, Dakota communities. I mean, it was 50 years in 2014. One would have thought we had had celebrations, we would have had honorings, we would have had just a great show of acknowledgement for that feat. And that feat was, was as equivalent to what happened in 1876, June of 1876. That's how significant that event was. Yet it's not talked about very much at all. Yeah, let's let's kind of talk about that. We've talked about it earlier, and this kind of does play into something that you have um, in your book as well regarding education in South Dakota, whether especially South Dakota universities. Um, part of that law um, was, I don't know if you want to say fueled or informed by uh, University of 
South Dakota professor, W.O. Farber, um, who wasn't exactly a friend to Indian country, I don't think, um, even though supposedly, you know, an unbiased researcher. So why do you think our education system, for example, your book, um, I mean, <laughs> not to toot your own horn or anything, but this is absolutely the definitive work, I believe, um, on the termination era. And it's not just me who says that, you know, you have the forward by Brian Deloria Jr., um, Elizabeth Cooklin also um, says, speaks of your book very highly, which she, you know, it does not give praise easily. And, you know, Indian scholars who know what they're talking about have, have uh, I guess, signed off, so to speak, on your book. But yet, you know, we're not, we're not coming across it at university or in high school. Um, and it's, it's a good read. Um, it's detailed name giving, but yet, um, written in a narrative fashion so that it is, um, <laughs> it's quite a plot. It's like, it's reading a thriller or something, you know, <laughs> um, it's, it's really good. So why don't we talk about that for, for a couple minutes, that was one of the reasons why Native Reads, you know, came about, um, and why the Oak Lake Writer Society exists is is in part because of this. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's really interesting, and and I might be wrong on some of these points, but like they have what they call the um, the OSEC standards, the Ocheti Shakwe Essential Understandings, that was developed. And when you go through there and you actually look at what they're requiring for their reading, um, books like mine and, and books like Nick's and others, that, that real hard-edged um, scholarship, the edgy scholarship, you won't, you won't find among the, uh, the OSEC standards or the OSEC. And, and that's by design. Um, I, think, I think what South Dakota really wants is um kind of a kind of a kumbaya education about native people you know powwows and, and uh you know the real the, the real soft literature um that that doesn't raise these questions about genocide and it doesn't raise these questions about our existence uh and that's part of the settler trope is to you know, this logic of elimination that, that exists as a structure and not as an event. So it's always an ongoing process. Whether it's delivered or not, I, I sense that subconsciously this, this is at work. That's why, not without our consent, um, has not been extensively used or adopted by um, universities in South Dakota. And there are there are non-native, let's say, law professors or other non-natives who write books, who and they get a better read and audience when they when you have these white professors or scholars writing about our people, they get they get uh, you know they're on the bookshelves of Barnes and Nobles and these other places. So one colleague of mine out of New Mexico, she came, she, she comes up to South Dakota. She had mentioned that she finds it astonishing that there's not this kind of literature that is out on the bookshelves when she visits uh, bookstores in South Dakota. They're the usual, um, what I would call the, the soft native literature, you know? Um, so, so, so there's that process going on. I think there's a, a an unconscious or subconscious marginalization of, of indigenous scholars. Um, that is why we did like the First Nation Sculpture Garden in Rapid City. We, we recognized uh, Oscar Howe, we recognized Black Elk, we recognized uh, Vine Deloria Jr. And then we recognized um, Charles Eastman. Just to say, um, we have our own literature and our own uh, scholars, intellectuals, thinkers 
Um, and and, I, and that, I think that's a very hard concept for a lot of settlers in South Dakota to wrap their minds around because they're so used to seeing, seeing us, you know, doing different kind of actions in defense of our sovereignty and self-determination. So, you know, there's, there's many prongs to freedom, and one of them is through literature. The other is through direct action. Definitely. Um, speaking of direct action, um, if I can read the paragraph, um, you, you write, Barber's study was quick to eliminate race as a factor. The white law enforcement officers of border towns that he interviewed uniformly denied that race was a factor in their arrests or in the convictions of Lakota people. And then you say, arguably, even if race were not a factor, certainly a Lakota's political status might have been. After all, the Lakota have been successfully challenging state and local hegemony. As Farber's study, Farber study was unwittingly revealing the subsequent anti-Lakota political backlash beyond the jurisdiction bills and court cases that whites initiated to neutralize Lakota self-determination likely included the increased harassment of the Lakota by state's law enforcement apparatus. Um, and you talk about the disproportionate arrest and incarceration of the Lakota. And obviously that has not ended. And so, you know, right now we are in a time of watching um, and being part of the push against police brutality. Um, and so, you know, we, I think a lot of times we think, oh, the educational discussions stay in the classroom, but really it doesn't. It's affecting all of us everywhere. And it does seem to me that as important as race and as somebody myself who's white passing, I want to make sure that I'm not like, um, you know, using my own privilege um, disrespectfully. But I really do feel that there is a political reality to our interactions with the police and the courts that goes beyond race. I mean, I, I think all all races have their own political issues, but ours is a little bit different. Um, do you want to do you want to talk speak to that at all, or disagree? Feel free to disagree with me. <laughs> well, thank you for that for that analysis because it is it is one of of, of political status. I mean, a lot of times, you know, when we do land acknowledgement, um, I always say I'm from, you know, I'm in my homelands, the Ocheti Shakoni Oyate homeland, which is currently occupied. That that sums it up to me of, of, of what's at stake here, because we have these documents called treaties and we have this memory and we have, you know, we have the we have the. The greasy grass fight. We have the rosebud fight. We have the uh, the fight in Minnesota. We as we as as the Ocheti Shakawi had really fought and intentionally fought a defensive battle against American uh, colonization and uh, um, and so what so what so so what we what we what we what we project is is a sovereign people. That we are willing to defend our homelands, and then we need to begin to talk in in language that that describes that, right? Because um, if I say land acknowledgement, I say I live in the occupied territory of the Ocheti Shock only. That disrupts um, the settler structure uh, because that's a fact. Our homelands are occupied. That's a reality, um, and the narr- and, and to suggest that disrupts the set- settler narrative, always. So it is one of politics. I know the Bradley Bill talked about returning um, and acknowledging our sovereignty and jurisdiction over over uh, the federal lands. Um, that really disrupted uh, the settler um, structures. To the point where Dashiell, being a Democrat, led led an organization or was behind an organization called the Open Hills Association, which resisted land return. And so we really have to think about this as being one of a of a of a of one of of a political question versus a racial question. Although those two will intersect. I mean, don't get me wrong; 
they will intersect. But it is one of it is one of politics. It is, in a sense, uh, what we are born into as as people of the Oteti Shakun, we have that rich history. We have those 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 significant sites, Wounded Knee, for example, the hanging of the 38 Dakota POWs in Mankato, and and all of this. So we so we as a people come into this um, contested space, uh, knowing full well. Uh, why we are here and what we are defending, and 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 that mitigate mitigates against settler colonialism, which which any any native permanence disrupts that project of settler colonialism, and so I would argue that today, you know, when we had when we had the action up up at Mount Rushmore, there were there were there were probably more than a handful of Washichu saying, this is a 21st century, and the deal was that these people would not be here. They would be resigned to history. And the fact that we are still here, just our permanent, just us being here disrupts the settler colonial project because we are still here. And so that plays into why we see disparities in health, disparities in education, Disparities on incarceration rates, you know, all the socioeconomic disparities are as a result of the settler colonialism. Absolutely, and I think it's also a difference of values. Um, you know, the person who was um, speaking to me about how, like, they thought they owned their land and this and that, um, when they probably never did, they had just overed on lease land. Um, <laughs> And because this is not just this family, I've heard this, you know, I, um, around Kadoka, you'll hear this from white ranchers who suddenly say they own their land and suddenly didn't, um, when we passed taxation, um, and lease fees. But, you know, it's also, somebody was saying, you know, well, why don't people leave and make something of themselves? <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, you and I, the other day, were talking about this. Everyone has, every tribal member has a part to play. You know, those who um, stay within our um, recognized, what's left of our treaty lands recognized, um, who are in the reservations, uh, focusing on kinship and, you know, and who are being impacted by socioeconomic issues like, you know, uh, no jobs, massive housing shortage and those things, um, you know, they're kind of holding... <laughs> They're holding a very important um, place in our in our nation um, in the Ochetti Shakowin because you know without them there you know like you said um, are the treaty obligations you know the state didn't want to have to deal with any of that you know the, it would you know right now South Dakota probably has this you know um, big cash pile that they're they're sitting on <laughs> and you know they they wouldn't be able to to deal with um, all of the um, costs that go into taking over those federal lands and the treaty treaty um, mm -hmm. issues. But on the flip side, you know, our people are known for their scholarship. Our writers are known for their literature. If, you know, people know something about Vine Deloria, no one remembers Farber, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, how, like, you know, this idea of the white or Western civilization as being, you know, worthy of being centered all the time. Like, they're not worthy of being centered all the time. You know, we are just, or maybe even more, um, you know, skilled in philosophy and thinking and all of these things. And, but we do all have our parts to play. So, you know, we talk about, I joke, I'm an expat in my own lands. You know, I'm, <laughs> I sit where, um, I believe it was Trevor DeSue, um, is the, the treaty that's, it's pretty messed up, but it affected the Dakota and that's what kind of covers Brookings County, um, in this area. Um, you know, but even in, you know, whether you're living in Minnesota or, you know, wherever we're at in our homelands. Yeah. We're, we're the ones that are, you know, 
there are people that are known for um, what we're doing. The Native Sculpture Garden that focus on, you know, Eastman and, and Native Reeds is really um, Ella Deloria. Right. Um, you know, some of the, the most amazing female scholars of the last century. And this, I would argue, are um, members of the Chetty Shockland. Um, so, you know, it really, <laughs> everyone has their, their part to play, for sure. Um, so before we go, you have uh, work that is coming out that's published, let's see, last month, right? Do you want to yeah. talk about that quick? And then we should probably wrap up. Yeah, just briefly, um, I'm an editor of a book called Colorizing Restorative Justice, and the subtitle is Voicing Our Realities. Uh, it just came out in June, and um, it's uh, 20 contributors to this volume and uh, uh, 18 chapters. And um, basically, uh, it's critiquing restorative justice and restorative practices over the last 25 or 30 years. And uh, it, it's, um, it really is about what, you know, has restorative justice been co-opted? And there's been some, these articles really point to the fact that there is something wrong within restorative justice and, and restorative practices. And particularly when I write about there being settlers in restorative justice and restorative practices, for example, I say, how can an indigenous person sit in a circle with settlers and they're trying to undo harms as a result of wrongdoing and they don't even address the first harm, which is the theft and genocide of indigenous people? I make that argument in my chapter. And, uh, and, and, and there's other, other people of color. And this is, and that was one of the things we just, we just wanted people of color to, to write about restorative uh, justice and restorative practices. So they come out with some really interesting insights and critique, critiques about restorative justice and restorative practice. So I'm very excited about the book. Um, we get a, we get a, we get a, we, of course, we get the reaction, right, from indi uh, indigenous peoples and people of color saying, good. And then from whites, it's like, Wow, um, it, the reaction is a little bit more muted uh, for the for the settlers. But thank you. Awesome, thank you, Ed. Oh, one one thing mm -hmm. uh, as a plug, uh, the the publisher is Living Justice Press. So if you Google Living Justice Press, you can get on the web page and check out the book. Awesome. We'll have that link on the Oakley Writer Society website too. Um, when we, because um, we do have a page dedicated to our podcast that also links to all the discussion guides. Yeah. Um, so that's a really good resource as well. Um, so, yeah, excellent. Well, it's always good to visit with you. Yes, it is. It's been a pleasure. And again, you know, for the for the listeners, I, I, I hope you listen to all the podcasts I've been listening to them. I find them very educational, very informative, and I'm very proud of uh, Sarah and Nick and others who have just revitalized the Old Quake Writer Society.